everyone, it's Jack from cultaholic.com and well, what an eventful episode of Dynamite that was. That's right, winter has arrived and this week's episode of Dynamite was I think the most eventful and, and significant episode of Dynamite since the show began, arguably alongside the first ever Dynamite because that was the first one, but a lot of stuff happened on last night's show and there was a lot to talk about. But how good was the show? There's only one way to find out and that is by assigning each individual segment a lovely individual grade. That's right, it's time for AEW Dynamite Winter is Coming Graded. So no messing about, we start things off straight away with the Dynamite Diamond Battle Royal. Uh, all the wrestlers in the Battle Royal are around the ring, raring to go. The bell rings, they all slide in, and, and the match is underway. No messing about at all to start this one. In fact, a lot of this show was match heavy rather than matches and segments and stuff, uh, which I think was probably a good idea just because... It, it, the action never seemed to slow down. Now, because this was a battle royal and lots of stuff happens in a battle royal, I'm going to consult my notes when I talk about this, just a list of stuff that happened. So, early on, Matt Hardy appears to eliminate Isaiah Cassidy, one of his young charges in Private Party. Bit strange, Matthew. Elsewhere, though, we get Hangman Page working together well, suspiciously well, with the Dark Orders, Reynolds and Silver. We get MJF helping out his inner circle, best buddy, Sammy Guevara. So, a lot of relationships being explored here. Oh, that sounds, that sounds so weird. Sean Spears hasn't got in the ring yet, the sneaky little muffin. What's he like? He gets in later on and hits the Death Valley driver onto Matt Seidel, onto the ramp, but then Scorpio Sky throws him out. And Tully Blanchard's in the stands and he is just not happy. So Blanchard gives Sean Spears the little metal slug which he holds in his fist, pops Sky through the ropes or like over the top of the ropes. Sky is limp and Wardlow can easily throw him out. More storylines being developed. Now Mark Quinn and Matt Hardy start working together really well. They eliminate both Reynolds and Silver. They go to eliminate Hangman as well with the poetry in motion with Mark Quinn playing the role of Jeff Hardy in this production, but instead the rest of the Dark Order are on the outside and they catch Hangman as he flies off the apron and they put him back into the ring. Back inside, he hits a buckshot lariat to Mark Quen, but then Matt Hardy sneaks up from behind him and dumps him out. That's a big contender in this match, eliminated by Matt Hardy. Then Kip Sabian is eliminated by Orange Cassidy. He is furious because it's the man he's feuding with. He drags him outside and attacks him. Miro slides under the bottom rope and joins in. And Miro starts to go on a bit of a roll once he returns to the squared circle. He eliminates Lee Johnson, who lasted quite a while for a rookie, to be fair. Mark Quen goes, Matt Hardy goes, and Joey Janela goes all down to the hands of Miro, who looks at the moment like the favourite to win the match. It all comes down to Miro, Jungle Boy, Wardlow, Sammy and MJF. And, and, and Orange Cassidy as well, who's laying out on the outside. And AEW thought we forgot about that. But we didn't, AEW, because this seems to happen in every Battle Royale these days. The Inner Circle all gang up on Miro and eventually, after a lot of struggle and a lot of effort, especially by Wardlow, they finally managed to dump Miro, arguably the favourite of this match, out of the ring. We then get a very nice exchange. It's like parkour moves between Jungle Boy and Sammy Guevara, hopping all over the place, up to the top rope, down on the apron, up to the top rope again, both of them, and MJF shoves both off to the floor, and Sammy is understandably very livid. MJF and Wardlow are the only two men in the ring, but then Wardlow realizes that Orange Cassidy is still left on the outside. So they go and get him, they bring him in the ring, and Orange starts firing up. Superman punches for everybody. He almost eliminates MJF, but Wardlow grabs him and saves his boss from falling out of the ring. But there's no stopping Orange Cassidy. He is on a massive roll at the moment, and he eliminates Wardlow, shockingly, and the bell rings. And I realized that throughout the whole of watching this match, I'd forgotten that it's actually the last two who win the match, and then they fight for the diamond ring next week. And I felt like, all oh, right, silly Billy. So the two winners are MJF, who doesn't look that happy with how things have gone down, but obviously he's got no choice, and Orange Cassidy. The best friends come down to celebrate with Cassidy, and then Penelope Ford, Kip Sabian, and Miro all run down and yell at the best friends while like six referees hold Miro back. So action-packed opening segment, but how good was it? I'm gonna give this a B grade. It was a bit of a match of two halves for me. I, I didn't really enjoy the opening half that much, but I did enjoy the latter stages. Uh, and regardless of how much I enjoyed the first half of the match, I have to admit, they absolutely packed all of the match with a lot of storyline development, which I've just ran through. So I think this was a useful 
a, a useful battle royal in terms of progressing various different angles. It wasn't the best one in terms of actual match quality, but it was certainly passable. I'm going to give it a B grade. Next up, off the back of Frankie Kazarian's, well, excellent recent performances and popping MJF in the mouth last week, he's taking on Chris Jericho one-on-one. -on -one. Early on in the match, Jericho's belt seems to break, so he just takes it off and throws it at Kazarian. Kazarian throws it back at him and they start brawling. That's veteran improvisation there. Hager and Ortiz have accompanied Jericho in this match. They are on the outside of the ring, and of course they get involved when the referee's back is turned. Kazarian manages to fight them off, gets back in the ring, but Jericho catches him upon re-entry with a code breaker. Ugh, grim, grisly. Kazarian fires up, they head up top, he hits a huge Spanish fly for a two count, a very near fall, good late kick out by Chris Jericho. And then Kazarian, he's obviously saved up two finishers because he taps both the shoulder buttons at once and slaps on the walls of Jericho on Chris Jericho. At this point, Ortiz on the outside is furious. He wants to get in the ring and attack Kazarian. Hager stops him because it might cause the D, well, it will cause the DQ. It's in full view of the referee. Although in AEW, you never quite know, do you? And then just as Hager has calmed Ortiz down and Jericho is still caught in the walls, here comes MJF from the back with a towel and he's gonna throw the towel in and cost Jericho the match, effectively. Shades, of course, of what he did to Cody Rhodes, but Sammy Guevara runs down, snatches the towel from MJF and says, no, that's not gonna happen. While this is all going on, Jericho has managed to get out of the walls of Jericho and commentary play up the fact that they think he's seen Sammy Guevara with the towel and thinks that Sammy was about to cost him the match when really it was MJF. Kazarian charges once again, straight into a Judas effect back elbow, one, two, three, and Chris Jericho picks up the win, but, but it's not over yet. There's more things to sort out here. All the inner circle get in the ring to celebrate, but it's not a very happy celebration because Sammy shoves MJF, everyone starts brawling and pulling each other apart, and Jericho gets on the mic and goes, stop it, I can't, I, I, in my head I was gonna do such a sick Jericho impression there, and it came out so not sick. Jericho says, right everybody, I'm sick of this. We need to go and have a seven day break and really think about where we are at as a group. And next week on Dynamite, we're gonna have an ultimatum and we're either gonna agree all to work together or the inner circle will break up forever. Oh. This gets a B plus grade from me. Great match by Frankie Kazarian, great performance by him, and also interesting developments with the inner circle. I would maybe have liked to have seen this booked in a, in a slightly different direction, maybe with Jericho just more blatantly blaming Sammy, thinking he was at fault maybe, to make MJF all the more despicable, and maybe even prepare Sammy for a face turn down the line. I suspect next week's probably gonna result in Sammy being kicked out of the inner circle, so we'll, we'll, we'll probably reach that end point anyway. But who knows, there are so many different directions they could go with this. Backstage, my boy, Alex Morves, is with the Young Bucks, who, uh, who hype their match next week with TH2, but they are interrupted by a team you might be unfamiliar with if you haven't watched AEW Dark or caught them on the indie scene. It's the pairing of Anthony Bowens, who I think I had heard of, and Max Caster, Platinum Max Caster, who I, I don't know if I had. I, I might have to think about that. I'm not sure if I'd heard of him before or not. They introduced themselves and then Max Caster, as you may have seen on Dark, he spits some bars. Basically Caster bust a sick free, a sick 32, about how um, basically the Young Bucks want to look at each other's willies. And I'm like, oh, that's a bit John Cena, Ruthless Aggression era. But that's kind of what he's going for. And he's charismatic enough that it does, it does sort of work. He finishes his rap by saying, we are the, I've never been able to do that. And I did make a slight noise there. That's insane. Wow. They introduce themselves, they're like, we are the acclaimed. And I'm like, okay, we'll see where this is going. And then they go, look behind you. And the Bucks turn around and they are jumped by TH2. And all four of them beat down the Bucks until Kazarian and Daniels come along and chase them off. It looks like the acclaimed not only are on Dynamite, but their heels too. Next up, we get Dr. Britt Baker at DMD, of course, taking on Layla Hirsch, who we haven't seen that much of, but she's been really impressive in the matches we have seen of her so far. Britt rolls to the outside, Layla Hirsch goes to follow with a dive, so Britt pulls Rebel in the way, and she takes the bullet. Oh, dearie me. Back in the ring, they're exchanging submission attempts, armbar attempt, lockjaw attempt, armbar attempt. They're going back and forth, but neither can really get the advantage until they get back to their feet, and Hirsch nails Britt Baker with a little bicycle knee strike. She should perhaps make a pinfall attempt here, but instead Layla goes up top, Rebel dashes around to the other side of the ring, makes the distraction, that allows Britt Baker to attack. She finally gets the lockjaw locked in, 
and wins via submission. And then Thunder Rosa attacks her straight away, out of nowhere. Referees all jump into the ring and pull Thunder Rosa and Britt Baker apart, stopping the brawl, but then Revel runs over to Thunder Rosa, who, who is being restrained by the way, and lands a few free shots. So then Layla Hirsch comes along, nails Rebel with a suplex and rolls out of the ring, and it gave her a little bit of shine. But I liked it as, as the close to the segment, but I want to know more. Yeah, I'm going to give this a B grade. I'm eager to learn. It was a decent match, by the way. I can't wait to see more of Layla Hirsch. She's got so much potential. Britt Baker, of course, very charismatic as always. But I want to learn more about why Thunder Rosa was attacked by Britt Baker in the first place. B is the grade. This is one for the future. Next up, we get Cody Rhodes and Darby Allen taking on Team Taz, represented by Powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky Starks. And the faces start this match off a bit hot, they're doing all right until Will Hobbs destroys Darby Allen, just folds him with a huge lariat on the outside. Then we move into the heat portion of this match. Often in wrestling matches, the heat segment can be a little bit boring with the heel team just isolating one of the faces. Not in this case, uh, Hobbs and Starks did a good job of really wearing down Darby Allen and keeping it entertaining throughout. At one stage, Will Hot Powerhouse Hobbs puts on, I think the best bear hug I've ever seen in wrestling. He's just ragdolling Darby Allen about and Darby's obviously selling it really well. Darby eventually escapes the clutches of both heels with two nimble back flips to get out of suplex attempts in a row, tags in Cody, Cody runs wild, he's taking out Hobbs and Starks left, right and centre, they're getting up, Cody's still knocking them down, it's old school babyface stuff, with a bit of a new school finish, because the, the finish comes when Cody heads up top, hits his surprisingly nimble Cody cutter, and Darby Allin tags him as he leaps onto the top rope, and then follows it up with an immediate coffin drop for the win. It's a unique finish, it was seamless, I enjoyed it, it's like something the bloody Young Bucks would have pulled off, lads. And the heels beat down the faces immediately afterwards because they are livid, Taz is conducting traffic, both of the baby faces are just getting destroyed, so Arn Anderson gets in the ring to try and stop it, and obviously gets taken down as well. And Shivani sells it really well on commentary, being like, oh, I'm worried about Arn. And Arn looks knackered, he's leaning against the ropes. It's quite effective. Now here comes Dustin Rhodes to save the day, but then here comes Brian Cage, the final member of Team Taz, and the numbers catch up on the baby faces once again. Who is going to save the day? I mean, you'll have seen it on social media by now anyway, but I've got to talk about it. So, the lights go down. And we get fake snow, and new music, and an awesome Tron, and Sting walks out into Daly's place. He's got the face paint, he's got the jacket, he's got the bat, and the heels obviously run away like they are the NWO, and it's 1998. Sting gets in the ring, Everyone's losing their minds on commentary and I'm assuming at home as well. Sting stares at Arn Anderson because of the history between the two. He stares at Cody. Cody, you know, loves Sting. It's his favourite wrestler. And he stares for the longest at Darby Allin. And that's the end of the segment. Wow. Now, before I give this a grade, I will say that just the match itself up until this point was my favourite match of the night. It was a basic tag team formula executed very well by all four men. Really enjoyed the match. Now... As for Sting's debut, that was interesting, very interesting indeed. Immediately when it happened, Twitter erupted into debate and arguments because a lot of people were saying, well, first of all, the majority of people were excited, but a lot of people, of course, were saying, well, when WWE brings a legend back, everyone's really cross at them, but when AEW does it, suddenly it's cool. Yeah, and I'll explain why it was cool. And by the way, this is coming from someone who's not even a big Sting fan. I'm too young to have caught him in his prime, I don't really get it. I was more of a WWE person, of course, as well. And also, there's a lot of people, a lot of people I prefer in the ring. I'm not a big Sting fan. I think Sting's cool. I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a Sting fan. But this was awesome. I mean, first of all, the presentation. It was amazing. The snow, the winter theme, the Tron, the music, Sting's, you know, expressions as well, and his walk down to the ring and the bat and the snow is still swirling around, and the visual, and him lining up with Darby, and they've both got face paint. Visually, this was produced superbly. So, so well. Secondly, I think, because a lot of people were saying, well, they've brought Sting back for no reason. No, I think this makes perfect thematic sense uh, for him to save Cody and Darby. I mean, Cody has said before, he's gone on record to say that Sting is his favorite wrestler. He idolized him growing up. He was, he was his favorite wrestler even though he's the son of Dusty Rhodes, but I guess, you know, you're not gonna, your dad's not gonna be a favorite wrestler, is he? Uh, then also, saving Darby, obvious thematic similarities there. People have been comparing Darby to Sting character-wise since, like, forever now, for years and years, since he first started to make waves for himself in Evolve. And finally, the third point as well, and this can't be overlooked, it just makes sense, doesn't it? 
When Sting came back in WWE, they put him in a feud with Triple H and he lost a match that he never should have lost. Uh, I mean, the NWO came out and helped Sting. It was all confused, it didn't really make sense and Sting lost and then shook Triple H's hand at the end. And it left a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths and probably rightly so. Now, this felt a lot more like it belonged I mean, Sting's back on TNT, he's back on the other side of the divide, being a rebel, being a vigilante, and being kind of, you know, anti-authoritarian in a way. It, it just, it makes sense for him to be in the other promotion that isn't WWE. It makes sense for him not to be with the establishment. And I think it was a really, really nice moment. And as I mentioned, I'm not even a big Sting fan, and I thought this was cool as hell. So Sting's back where he belongs, the match was a good one, Ricky Stark's shoulders were a little bit off the map, a little bit off the map, but the match was good enough that I'll, I'll overlook it. I'm giving this an A grade overall. What a segment, what a segment. And it was only probably the second most eventful thing of the night. Next up, we get my boy, Alex Marvez, backstage with the AEW Women's Champion, Hikaru Shida. He talks about Abaddon and says, why did you uh, run away, basically, from Abaddon? Why did you not attack her when she interrupted you last week? And when she had your belt in her hands and she licked it, and Shida says, I'm not scared of Abaddon. And then we get a weird noise in the background and Shida's like really spooked. And she says, can we do this later? And Marvez is like, we're live, pal. And then she goes, all right, and just leaves. She's... She's scared. She's really shook, guys. Next up, we get a pre-match, kind of pre-shot earlier in the day as well, promo from John Moxley, the AW World Champion, who reflects on everything that AW has done in its very short life so far, and then turns his attention to Kenny Omega and the match that's coming up next, their mesh of styles, their hatred for each other. And he throws in a nice little verbal tribute as well to Pat Patterson. It was quite subtle, but it was very classy, very nicely done. No grade, of course, it was too short a segment, really too great, but he was in front of a chain link fence. So cool points for that. And then we get the main event of the night, Moxley defending his title against Kenny Omega with Don Callis out on commentary. Kenny Omega's friend, of course, also involved with Impact, also a great commentator too. Um, I'm sure that he will play a minor role in proceedings. He's just there kind of to add, I guess, a bit of garnish to the side. He's there for, for the atmosphere. And as the bell rings, there is half an hour of the show left to go. So they gave this quite a lot of time. Uh, they start off wrestling, which Kenny obviously gets the better of. Then they move to striking, which Moxley gets the better of, just walking through some of Kenny's huge chops and just walking him down and landing a few right hands. They take things to the outside, they brawl up to the barricade and then over into the first few rows of seats. And they do so for a very, very long time, really. The referee doesn't start the count. He's being very, very lenient. And I think at a certain point, it starts to become noticeable that, hey, these guys have been out here for a long time, but they do eventually bring it back to the ring. Back in the ring, Omega is trying to take out the base of Moxley, attacking the legs. He also goes for the, you can't escape, and Moxley escapes and counters it. Um, one of several of Omega's signature moves that Moxley countered throughout this match, showing that he'd really done his homework. Also, the you can't escape might be the funniest move in all of wrestling because quite often people Escape from it. Omega presses the advantage, he heads to the apron, he goes to springboard back in, straight into a front kick from Moxley, paradigm shift. I'm like, made the cover. Moxley doesn't make the cover. He gets out of the ring and gets a pair of chairs, and I'm like, oh no, he knows this will get him DQ'd. Surely, like, surely he wants to beat Omega clean. I was wrong to jump to that conclusion. Instead of attacking Omega with the chairs, Moxley sets them up opposite each other and drags Omega into one and gets him to sit down, sits opposite him, and he wants a big manly trading of right hands. And I'm like, oh, this is very cool and very Moxley. So they start by slapping each other. Then it progresses to big right hands. Not like that, not a little short little, what was that, Jack? Big right hands, still better than that was. And they were work punches as well, but they start punching each other a lot. Moxley wins the exchange. He sends Omega flying with one of his punches, but Omega stumbles backwards and then rushes forwards, V-trigger, and Moxley goes tumbling backwards off his chair. But Moxley gets up, he's back in it, wham! Another Lariat, a bit of a desperation Lariat to turn the tide, and another paradigm shift. One, two, Kenny kicks out. Kenny is reeling, he's in danger of losing the match at this point, so he rolls out the ring to avoid further punishment. Moxley dives after him, straight into a mid-air V-trigger. Kenny rolls a near unconscious Moxley back in the ring. Tiger Driver 98, one, two, Moxley kicks out. 
They both attempt their own finishers but counter them and then Omega hits a big drop kick and then does the Rainmaker pose. It's an Okada tribute in this match. I loved it. Ripcord V-Trigger, his version of the Rainmaker, basically. Uh, then he goes for the warming and Angel, but Moxley fights it and fights it, and Omega has to settle for Kreutz Wrath, which only gets him two. So Kenny goes for Kota Ibushi's signature move, and one of his own signature moves as well. It's kind of, it's Kenny's move as well, isn't it? The Phoenix Splash. He heads up top, Moxley springs back to life, and shoves Omega to the outside. And he heads out straight after him, Paradigm Shift, into one of the ringside heaters because it's cold because wind is coming you see and omega is out kayfabe out the refs run down and check on him they're like no he's out we need a doctor don Callis even heads down from commentary he's checking on omega as well moxie's in the ring getting impatient you can see and if moxie does any emotion well it's impatient he's like Right, okay, come on, come on. And then he snaps, he runs out the ring, chases the referees away, Don Callis goes scurrying, he grabs Omega and drags him in the ring. And Don Callis is on the apron now and gets a mic. Callis is saying he's hurt, he's hurt, stop it. And Moxley goes over and shoves him down onto the ramp. And the microphone tumbles into the ring and Kenny Omega picks it up. The referee goes to check on Callis. Moxley turns around, bam! Mic shot from Kenny Omega. Moxley is bleeding everywhere. And Kenny Omega's cheated despite both guys wanting to beat the other fair. Several V-triggers later, Omega gets Moxley up, nails him with the one-winged angel, which nobody kicks out of. If anyone's gonna kick out of it, it's gonna be Moxley. One, two, he doesn't kick out of it. Three, Kenny Omega is the new AEW World Champion. And there's no big celebration. There's no confetti, there's no in-ring, like, jubilance from other members of the roster. What happens instead? is I think far more interesting. Don Callis grabs Kenny Omega, Omega grabs the belt, and they run out of the venue. They head through the back, there's a tracking shot, Tony Khan shouting at them as they leave, they ignore him. The rest of the roster are there all going, what the hell, what have you done, Kenny? They ignore them. They head out to the parking lot, there's a car waiting for them. This has all been set up by Callis and Omega. And just as they're about to reach the car, just as they're about to get in and escape, who should stop them from behind a nearby truck? But my boy, Alex Marvez with the scoops. He comes along with the mic. He's like, what the hell guys? And I'm like, Marvez, you've absolutely nailed it. Callis turns to Marvez and goes, you will get your answers, Alex, on Tuesday. And Marvez and myself go, Dynamite's on Wednesday. And Don Callis goes, Tuesday night, Impact, you will get your answers. And they get in the car and leave and i'm like what and while i'm trying to digest that back at ringside we see moxley all stunned and bleeding in the middle of the ring and eddie kingston's on commentary for some reason going i'm not waiting until next week i want lance archer right now and then the show ends and i'm like oh eddie what was that about i i, I don't know what that was about but that's not the important thing here the important thing i'm sure we'll get our answers on eddie and lance next week the important thing here is what the hell has just happened not just an aw but generally to the wrestling landscape. Because title changes are the best, I think, or the most effective when it feels like they are significant and something has changed and the landscape has shifted. Like Austin Michaels at WrestleMania 14, a huge passing of the torch, WWE or F, never looked back. CM Punk versus John Cena at Money in the Bank 2011, at the time, it felt like something amazing was gonna happen and the Punk was gonna be, they cut that storyline short, obviously, but at the time, it felt seismic. This is another one of those title changes that feels like something has changed. So now we know that there's an AW Impact Alliance of sorts, Omega's gonna turn up on Impact next week, and I guess it opens up the possibility of a lot of different stuff, like a lot of different stuff. As for the match itself, uh, I wasn't that optimistic going in because I think that their styles were slightly too much of a mismatch. Obviously when Moxie's had amazing matches, it's been with the likes of Ishii, other people who can brawl really well with him and have a, just a, a, a slugfest. Omega's best matches are with other super workers of his kind, like Kazuchika Okada, for example. However, I still think this was really, really good. They both worked well with what they gave each other. And even though I think it fell just short of match of the year candidate quality, I still think it was very, very good. So that combined with that groundbreaking aftermath, I have to give this segment an A plus and I cannot wait to see what happens next. But how good was the show overall? Well, it was a two segment show really, wasn't it? Sting's return and this whole weird impact reveal uh, but at the same time, the rest of the show was pretty consistent as well. It wasn't as like blow away amazing as the other two segments, but it was still very entertaining and it moved storylines forward. So we got the inner circle stuff, which is gonna hopefully move on next week and be 
you know, escalated further. We've got the Dynamite Diamond Battle Royal, which is going to lead to MJF versus Cassidy. And also, we've got um, interesting developments in the women's division too, with the likes of Thunder Rosa getting involved with Britt Baker, and also Hikaru Shida, the women's champion, basically being blatantly terrified of her next challenger. So, I'm going to give it an A grade. I don't think the quality was always an A, but I think that this was a huge wrestler, one, maybe like one of the most important televised wrestling shows in recent memory. It was huge. Obviously, this could all fall flat on its face and we could look back and say, well, that was a promising beginning, but it never went anywhere. But you never know. You never know at all. And I think there's very intelligent people in AEW. I think Don Callis is very intelligent. Scott Demore, there's intelligent people in Impact. They can possibly find a way to really make this work. The problem when promotions clash is that both want to go over, both want to be seen as the stronger promotion. They're going to have to find a way to balance that or someone's going to have to take the L. And if someone's going to take the L, it's probably going to be Impact because AEW got all the momentum in the world right now. But let's give it a chance. Let's see how it goes. It's very exciting times. And so that is it for AEW Dynamite Graded. Thank you very much for watching. And I'm really keen to know what people think of this in the comments section down below. Thanks once again. I've been Jack from Cultaholic.com. Stay safe out there. Stay positive and I'll see you very soon.